Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jim Finkenauer. Uh, we're here at the University of Pennsylvania. It's uh, November 14th, 1997. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be interviewing my distinguished colleague from the uh, Rutgers University School of Criminal Justice, uh, Professor Gerhard Mueller. Uh, thank you, Gerhard. Welcome. Pleasure. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying, uh, by, by way of preparation uh, for uh, this interview, uh, I asked uh, Professor Mueller for a copy of his uh, curriculum, Vita. Uh, and let me just say it's, it's 60 pages long. Uh, and at, at the risk of uh, uh, overusing a trite phrase, I would characterize it as awesome, uh, as the young people would say. Uh, for instance, 23 books authored or co-authored, 20 edited books, 269, repeat, 269 articles. The, the first question I have to ask is, how, how does one go about compiling uh, such an impressive uh, uh, vita as this? I guess one has to start early in life and live long enough <laughs> to complete the task. Mm -hmm. t t tell me something or tell us something about for example, your, your work style. I mean, uh, for example, do you, are, you, are you a morning person? Do you write in the morning? How do you write? When you're going to write something, how do you go about you know, deciding what to write on, what materials to use? I mean, how, how do you do that? Uh, Jim, decidedly, I am not a morning person. I like to sleep until I wake up. In fact, I never get up before I wake up. It's just bad to walk around when you're not awake. <laughs> but then I stay up for as long as it takes to complete the job. And I may have given myself for 12 hours or 24 hours, and if it takes 24 hours to finish a certain chapter or part of a chapter, a section perhaps, well, then I stick with it uh, with coffee and an occasional cigar until the job is done. Then I go to sleep. How, how like, do you have a special place where you write or a, a particular way that you write? Yes, I have a special place. I, I have a very old-fashioned desk at which I like to write. I do not use uh, a word processor for writing. I am very old-fashioned. I uh, write with a pen. Thank God my uh, secretary uh, understands my handwriting and can transmit, transpose it properly. <laughs> you, 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 you've been in this field for many years. Uh, I mean, my, my uh, estimate is somewhere on the order of uh, uh, 45, 47 years, uh, something on that order. <clears throat> what, what was it about, and you first, you first went into law before you got into this thing we call criminal justice, but what, what, what attracted you about uh, this area? Well, Jim, I started <clears throat> in law enforcement. Uh, my first job, uh, that was 52 years ago, was a, as a British police officer. But uh, you asked a uh, uh, further question, how did I get interested in it? It was during the Hitler years, uh, we lived in Germany, I must have been around 15 or 16 years old. Uh, when some of us had a, a, a little club. We each bought a copy of the penal code, and on uh, free afternoons, we would go to the county courthouse and uh, sit in the courtroom and listen to the proceedings. Uh, it may have been a case of chicken theft or bicycle theft or something like that, and we would bet on the outcome of the case. Mm -hmm. uh, using our penal codes. This was at age 15 or 16? 15 or 16. What, I mean, what, what was it about the law? I mean, as, say, as opposed to soccer or, uh, or some other subject well, or something. I didn't start the club. The club was started by the son of a judge. Uh -huh. And he somehow succeeded in getting us interested. Uh -huh. So that's what we did. Uh -huh. But one fine day, we wound up on the other side of uh, the courthouse mm -hmm. where the political trials took place. Mm -hmm. It was so-called People's Court. There, the judges had the swastika and eagle on their black robes. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget the first case I heard there. A little old man who was charged with a, a crime in the nature of treason, namely having listened to a, a, the BBC London mm -hmm. German language broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a miserable defense. The defense attorney argued, oh, well, he was just looking for another German station and got mm -hmm. stuck and things like that, which was mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could do better than that. Or maybe I should go into the law. Mm -hmm. Well, the poor fellow got 10 years, and that meant concentration camp, and that meant death. Mm -hmm. 
So I knew that there was something sinister about the law as well, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know more about it. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity years later, when I was in the British service, mm -hmm. in a police unit. Mm -hmm. Now you left Germany when? <coughs> I left Germany in 1945, before the end of the war. Uh, at that time I was in the German Navy. Somebody blew the whistle on a few of us who were dissidents, you might say. We griped, we talked about the end of the war. Two of them wound up clearing landmines. Uh, before anything serious could happen, I wound up in the Naval Academy, but there, apparently, the report was received about my involvement. Mm -hmm. They found out that I was a nephew of Philip Scheidemann, one of Hitler's worst enemies, the founder of the Weimar Republic of Germany. I was charged with having lied to the Navy by not having disclosed that I'm Philip Scheidemann's nephew. Well, I replied that I'd never been asked about it. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't good enough. So I was being volunteered to the one-man torpedoes, mm -hmm. uh, which gave me a very good incentive to leave the German service and make it through to the British lines, where I was welcomed mm -hmm. and uh, had the opportunity first to serve in an unarmed unit and uh, later I became a sergeant in a, a British police unit, where our principal task was to track down war criminals for trial at Nuremberg and elsewhere. And that's really the way it started for me. This police this unit was operating in, the British police unit was operating in Germany? It was operated <coughs> in uh, Germany, well, all over Europe, but my particular post was uh, uh, out of a German port. I was mm -hmm. in charge of a uh, small Coast Guard Cutter British uh, police boat. Mm -hmm. And we operated in uh, German waters, Danish waters, uh, the Baltic, as well as the North Sea. Mm -hmm. And then when, when did you first come to the United States? Uh, I left the British service in 1947, came to the United States in 1949. In between, mm -hmm. I studied in uh, Britain, in uh, Switzerland, and in Germany. Mm -hmm. And you, came, you went to law school when you came to the United States? I went to law school because <coughs> that is where most of the courses were concentrated that had anything to do with criminal law and criminology. Mm -hmm. But uh, I took a number of courses outside law school, courses of a more sociological or criminological nature. So you, you had this consistency then of focus on this area of Absolutely. criminal law? Absolutely, and, and that I think really started uh, at age 15, and mm -hmm. I stuck with that. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you, you taught law first, uh, University of Washington, 1953? Yes, my first teaching job was at the University of Washington uh, School of Law. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught introduction to law and a bit of criminal law as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. plus a legal reading, writing program. But this was, this was a law school curriculum and you were teaching within that sort of structure of the law school. And exactly, exactly. <clears throat> and then in 1960, however, at NYU, where you were also on the law faculty, you ventured into a new arena. Uh, maybe you could tell us uh, uh, about this. Well, I was invited to join the NYU uh, law faculty as a criminal law specialist in 1957, I think it was, 57, and soon started a project called the Comparative Criminal Law Project. The purpose of which it was to uh, uh, do comparative studies in criminal law to find out whether they are transplantable ideas and institutions in mm -hmm. legal systems that can be used in other legal systems so as to improve the administration of justice. Mm -hmm. and then in the 1960s, I forgot exactly which year, we broadened the uh, scope of this research and action project and called it the Criminal Law Education and Research Center. Mm -hmm. Uh, which at one time had as many as 23 staff members, mm -hmm. uh, including teachers. Uh, we engaged in intensive uh, uh, teaching enterprises in criminology, in criminal justice, in uh, foreign and comparative criminal law and procedure, international criminal law, and so on, uh, leading toward a master's of law or a doctorate in uh, criminal law. So this, but this was quite different than, than the traditional uh, law school offerings in the areas of, uh, of criminal law. Yes, Jim, it was something uh, uh, quite new. Uh, it had become apparent through the uh, uh, Warren Court criminal procedure revolution in the Supreme Court of the United States that we needed a whole new breed of 
criminal law specialist or criminal mm -hmm. justice specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that were needed to run a system by the standards demanded by the Supreme Court did not exist, so we had to create them. Mm -hmm. So we at NYU then became one of the foremost institutions where young people in uh, criminal law and criminal justice could obtain their specialization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we see then this period of the 1960s when criminal justice is actually being born uh, as an academic discipline. Uh, you, you were sort of a bridge between what had been the traditional ways of teaching law and criminal law to this new subject of, of criminal justice. What, what, what do you see as being the difference between criminal justice? Well, first of all, what do you see criminal justice as being and how do you see that as different okay. than criminal law and, and what the traditional approach had been. Right. <clears throat> Nobody knew exactly how to do it at the time. So I sat down and prepared a long memorandum, uh, sent it to the Ford Foundation, and asked for $10 million. One million to This is why you were at NYU. You I, at NYU. Okay. I, I suggested that <clears throat> 10 top law schools be picked. And they should each be permitted to start an experimentation in creating a new profession, criminal justice specialists mostly law-based, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Ford Foundation called me in and said, we like the idea, we're going to do it. But can you do it for $1 million? I said, I'll take the million and I'll do it mm -hmm. at NYU. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the Ford Foundation did set aside $10 million and awarded nine further grants to other law schools for this experimentation. Mm -hmm. it, we did indeed create, if you will, a new profession. Uh, mm -hmm. We had, in, in within a very few years, we had dozens and dozens and dozens of young people now going into the teaching of criminal law and criminal justice at law schools mm -hmm. as well as at the then emerging schools of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. But after about five or six years, the Ford Foundation asked Lloyd Olin and myself to visit the ten schools, including my own, mm -hmm. and find out, to find out exactly what happened. And we came to the sad conclusion that for the most part, law schools had rejected this alien body. They were more interested in training people for Wall Street mm -hmm. than in training them for the new criminal justice mm -hmm. profession. Mm -hmm. uh, at a few schools like Chicago uh, and at NYU, it had indeed worked very well, but at most schools, it petered out. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this new discipline, so-called, of criminal justice, this was also not criminology. Criminology was uh, part of the requisite elements. Uh, one of the first things I did there was to uh, uh, engage a uh, very competent uh, young uh, sociologist, criminologist, lawyer to teach an introductory course into criminal uh, uh, theory, criminology. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was part of the program. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how uh, criminal law specialists can run a criminal justice system knowing only the law albeit the criminal law, mm -hmm. they have to know uh, criminological theory as, as well, well. Mm -hmm. and methodology. Mm -hmm. So we taught all that. Mm -hmm. But l let, me, let me jump ahead uh, a few years. Uh, so so you, you basically were working, a working academic beginning about 1953 for some 20, 21 years if I count correctly. Suddenly in 1974, you give up uh, the world of academia to, go, to become an administrator, to, to, to join the United Nations. Uh, tell us about, you know, wh why did you do that? Uh, what, 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 what did the UN want you to do? What did you do uh, in, in, in joining the UN? Well, nobody was more astonished than I was, but uh, I got a call uh, one fine day from the Secretary General of the United Nations asking me whether I would be willing to be considered for the post of director of the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Branch, which is uh, that part of the United Nations Secretariat that is responsible for crime prevention and criminal justice efforts worldwide. In other words, an effort to assist member states to deal with their crime problems. Mm -hmm. It's such a unique opportunity that uh, I was not prepared to say no. I said yes. Mm -hmm. And very soon thereafter, joined the Secretariat as a director. Now, had this position existed prior to this? Yes. The crime prevention and criminal justice effort of the United Nations date, uh, date, dates back to uh, uh, 1950, I'm sorry, 1947, mm -hmm. when Sir Leon Rachinowitz 
received the first invitation from the Secretary General to be the chief of that particular unit. Mm -hmm. And he was in that position for one year. Uh, several others followed thereafter. The section grew, became a branch, ultimately mm -hmm. a division, uh, and is now the United Nations Center for International Crime Prevention. Mm -hmm. So it is almost as old as the United Nations itself, mm -hmm. because crime prevention, or as it was originally called, social defense, mm -hmm. was regarded as an absolutely necessary ingredient mm -hmm. in helping nations to provide for domestic peace, tranquility, mm -hmm. and prosperity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what was it like to move from this sort of nice, sort of relatively safe world of, of academia, where you're a tenured professor and so on, and now you're in this highly volatile political international uh, arena. Uh, I mean, how, how does one go about dealing with that? What kind of problems, for example, does one face un under those circumstances? The uh, problems uh, have a wide range. Uh, the problem on the first day was that one of my uh, staff members was arrested uh, uh, two floors beneath my office she was arrested for trespassing because our uh, Xerox machine had conked out, and she was using TWA's Xerox machine, whereupon she was arrested. That was the first problem I encountered in the United Nations, mm -hmm. and it was the only arrest situation I had to deal with. No, the problems primarily were that uh, we had insufficient resources, and yet had to produce, uh, fulfill the mandates that were given to us by the General Assembly of the United Nations or the Economic and Social Council, or sometimes directly coming from the Secretary General, mm -hmm. they had to be produced within a, an incredibly short time span, mm -hmm. yet frequently research had to be done. Mm -hmm. So it was a question of getting things done without adequate resources. Mm -hmm. That meant that at least in my unit, in crime fashion and criminal justice, just about everybody stayed on duty until midnight, night after night. Mm -hmm. In my eight years with the United Nations, I don't think I slept longer than maximum seven hours a night. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Problems of diplomacy were far less. Uh, members of the staff of the United Nations are not identified by their nationality. Their international civil service, they're neutral. Mm -hmm. Ergo, they enjoy the respect of all member governments. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians would talk with me as freely as the Chinese or as mm -hmm. uh, the Americans. Uh, problems of diplomacy really did not exist. It, it's a very cordial, uh, if you will, uh, environment. Mm -hmm. You have to play diplomatic games from time to time so as to create coalitions to support a given initiative. You know that the majority of uh, states want a certain thing done. Some are reluctant to participate while you may have to meet with the ambassador to see whether you can sway them to come around your way. Uh, but that's the normal course of diplomacy, and I enjoyed that very much. Well, what did you find the state of criminal justice to be uh, in countries, you know, the member states of the United Nations? Well, they all had a system of criminal justice in one form or another. Uh, some were very punitive, others were not punitive. Uh, uh, some were operating very successfully, and others were not. And uh, our job frequently was to find out what works, what is successful in query, is that transplantable, so it can be used in other settings, in other countries. Mm -hmm. This led ultimately to the development, at the request of the General Assembly, of uh, United Nations norms, guidelines, and standards. Uh, which could be prepared to resolve given issues in criminal justice. For example, the treatment of prisoners or uh, code of conduct for police enforcement, uh, law enforcement officials. What we did was we gathered the best experience of all humankind, of all countries, and they all had some experience or another, mm -hmm. and put it all together, prepared a draft, which was then debated in the Committee of Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, in the Economic and Social Council, in the General Assembly. And by golly, ultimately, uh, all member states agreed, yes, these are the basic standards that should be applied when it comes to running a police force. Mm -hmm. Or these are minimum standards and guarantees for dealing with prisoners, or for dealing with uh, children uh, before the law. There's practically no area of criminal justice on which there are not uh, some such standards which are agreed upon by the entire world and which indeed rest 
on the practical experience and on the research experience of uh, the entire world. Well, what would you regard as your greatest achievement in this, in, the, in your UN experience? And by the way, you continue to do uh, work with the UN, with UN affiliated organizations and so on. <clears throat> well, I think the, uh, the most successful enterprise which was started during my administration was the uh, uh, World Crime Survey. In other words, a, uh, a world crime statistic, which uh, was based on responses to questionnaires sent out to all governments of the world. Governments were asked to, if you will, regroup their crime statistics into comparable categories so that we had something to compare with. Mm -hmm. We started that uh, for the period from 1970 to 1975 when the first report on uh, world crime uh, came out in 1977. It was the first, albeit crude, uh, data set on which we could see something in the nature of trends, at least over a five-year period. We could compare uh, the problems of developing countries versus the problems of developed countries and so on. This war crime survey was ultimately expanded to include uh, the operations of criminal justice systems such as personnel involved, the cost of running the criminal justice system, and some experience data on what works and what does not work. The war crime survey is now in uh, is starting its um, seventh uh, repeat the sixth survey has just been completed. Uh, the seventh survey will cover only a two-year period, and there's hope that from here on we can do it in, I say we, I'm retired. <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's like the priesthood. <laughs> when you retire from it's the priesthood, odd retirement, though, isn't it? you don't stop believing in God. Words, right. So I don't stop believing in the United Nations. I still feel very much involved, <laughs> and indeed I have uh, helped uh, my colleagues of the old branch in redeveloping and uh, further developing the World Crime Survey and uh, many other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you to, to sort of take a very broad perspective on this field and, and think about how, how, if you think it is, the field is different today than it was 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when you were first beginning these developments, for example, at NYU and so on. I mean, how is the field, is it different? And, and if so, how is it different? You mean the field of criminal justice? Right. For one thing, it is now a professional field. It, 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 criminal justice has become a discipline. We have our own schools of criminal justice, graduate schools and undergraduate schools of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. 35 years ago, there was not a single program in crime prevention and criminal justice uh, at, at any academic institutions. Well, there were a couple of police programs and there were a few criminology programs, like here at mm -hmm. the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But criminal justice as a discipline was really born only in the wake of one, the Warren Court decisions, uh, if you will, constitutionalizing the criminal process. Thereupon, Congress' action in the Omnibus Crime and Safe Streets Act, which created the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, which provided the funding for the creation of an academic discipline of uh, teaching institutions in criminal justice. Uh, the next step was when we found out that the law schools didn't want us, some of us started schools of our own. You started Trenton, uh, then were in on the ground floor at Rutgers University. That was the great time when we started this discipline, crime prevention and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So what is happening in the field today is that we no longer have uh, a bunch of amateurs running around uh, doing things the wrong way. We now have professionals running around sometimes doing things the wrong way, but uh, <laughs> mostly doing it much better because we have the research in which we can base our demands and our programs. So there's reason to be proud of this. I think it was a very, very exciting period, the creation of criminal justice as a profession. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic about where we are and where we're going in, in, in this area? Yes, I, I am uh, quite optimistic. Uh, we are probably doing quite well in uh, some respects, uh, for example, in uh, uh, looking at the victims of crime and dealing with victimization prevention and dealing with victims. We're doing very well. We are doing much better than we uh, have in the past in uh, professionally policing uh, our communities. 
crime rates are dropping, and undoubtedly there's a relation to a better, more professional uh, uh, policing uh, techniques. So we're doing well in a number of respects. We are as yet like babes in arms when it comes to the new challenge as a result of globalization. Mm -hmm. We are not ready to deal with globalized transnational crime, of which we have oodles of categories, probably uh, 18 or something like that. Mm -hmm. There I am, uh, well, I'm optimistic. Again, we have to create the people that can deal with the situation. We have to instill an understanding mm -hmm. uh, of what globalization means mm -hmm. for the crime problem. Mm -hmm. Then I think we can uh, jointly with other nations, hopefully through the United Nations, deal with a globalized village. Mm -hmm. so the crime problem is still is a village problem. Mm -hmm. The village has grown. The village is the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, 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 me, let me ask you about, I, I know this because I happen to be a, a player in a, in a small way in this project, but this, as an example of what you're just describing, this Erfurt uh, uh, experience, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and about how you got involved in that and what's, what's that about and in terms of exemplifying mm -hmm. uh, what, you're, what you're describing. Yes. Well, Canadians and Americans uh, both were very proud in having created uh, a new profession, criminal justice, through schools of criminal justice. And some of our European colleagues have looked at us with a certain amount of envy. In Germany, criminology is still sort of a little appendix of the law faculties and, and hasn't gone anywhere. Um, so with the help of some European colleagues, we try to export the idea of criminal justice as a discipline and as a teaching institution mm -hmm. uh, into Europe. Uh, at this city in uh, central Germany uh, called Erfurt, uh, we held a, uh, a, uh, a summer conference of four weeks to which um, young scholars interested in criminal justice criminology from many European countries, especially Eastern European countries, were invited to become acquainted with what criminal justice is, what it can do, what this discipline has to do with controlling the crime rates and humanizing the system of the administration of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, the four-week uh, workshop was a great success, but um, as yet, no faculty of criminal justice has been created anywhere in Europe. So in that sense, we were not successful mm -hmm. as yet. Mm -hmm. But as, as of yet, I mean, it's we it's haven't not, given up. This is not a dead letter right. uh, issue. Let's assume that we have. I mean, I, I don't know who's ever going to watch uh, uh, any of these videos actually. But let's assume uh, at some point there's some young people who are considering uh, entering uh, this discipline. Uh, what what would you want to tell them? I mean, about encouraging them, why they should be encouraged to do this, I mean, what, what, what would you offer them? Okay, let me make there are a distinction between uh, the European market and the American market. The employment problem on the European market has been precisely the obstacle to the creation of schools or faculties of criminal justice, because the question has always been asked, well, what are these young people going to do? Where do they find jobs? They are not lawyers, so they can't do law work. Mm -hmm. They're not social workers, so they cannot do social work. Where are they employable? Mm -hmm. In America, North America, United States and Canada, we have, in effect, created a job market for the graduates of our schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is not a self-respecting city, county, or state in the United States that has, does not have a criminal justice planning office. People have to look at the way crime has moved, what has been done about it, with what impact, what can be done about it. Everything is part of a, uh, an exercise to control the crime problem and to humanize and ma render more effective the system of uh, criminal justice at mm -hmm. the city level, the county level, the state level, and indeed largely on, on the federal level as well. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds, there are thousands of opportunities there. Police departments have their uh, uh, research units and, and planning agencies. So do departments of uh, corrections. So do uh, court systems, uh, administrative offices for the uh, uh, operation of the courts. They all need specialists to do precisely what we are teaching. So our young people 
as you know, we've been in existence for a quarter of a century, never have had any problem of finding a job mm -hmm. upon graduation. Mm -hmm. Those uh, uh, who have obtained doctorates very frequently uh, become uh, professors themselves uh, because there's a continuing need for new blood on the market. Uh, many have become directors of uh, uh, research centers uh, at uh, the mid-management, mid-level management post. Uh, there is plenty of opportunity for people with a master's degree uh, to work as researchers, planners, organizers, and so on. Mm -hmm. I, I ask you what you thought your greatest accomplishment was uh, uh, with the UN. Uh, let me let me ask you to think more broadly. What what would you consider over the whole range of your your career in this discipline, uh, what, what would you regard as your proudest uh, accomplishment? Well, let's not put it in terms of accomplishment. Let, let's say what was, what gave me the greatest pleasure in doing always was to find something that had not been done before mm -hmm. and to start doing it. Mm -hmm. That was, for example, my work in international criminal law. There was no textbook on international criminal law. No course anywhere was being taught on international criminal law. Well, I realized the need for international criminal law. Look, now we have tribunals sitting there to deal with uh, uh, international uh, criminality. Mm -hmm. So I started international criminal law as a discipline. Mm -hmm. I started comparative criminal law as a discipline. Nobody had done it before. And, well, I was very instrumental in getting certain organizations going. Mm -hmm. uh, starting the World Crime Survey. It's been a real pleasure to think up new ideas, useful ideas, ideas that con can contribute to uh, solving the crime problem to some extent. Uh -huh. I may not be able to stick with any one of these initiatives, uh, for one thing, someday I'll be called home to my ancestors and someone who else have to do it. But I'm proud of the fact that I was in a position at the right place at the right time to mm -hmm. get things started. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you regard uh, the, the opening, for example, with this, the collaboration with the Soviet uh, Union's Academy of Sciences uh, in this area of, of groundbreaking, uh, let's say, uh, a groundbreaking effort? Yes, Jim, I, I think that was uh, one of those things. Uh, shortly after my retirement from the United Nations, I uh, uh, got in touch with some colleagues that I had met during my years at the United Nations, of whom I knew that they were decent human beings and good scholars and researchers in the area of uh, crime control. And I told them, okay, I'm no longer with the United Nations, but might you be interested in working on scientific issues which are of concern to your country as well as ours. Mm -hmm. And the answer was an enthusiastic yes, even though at the time uh, the Soviet Union and the United States were still having their uh, uh, Iron Curtain problems. These were the Cold War years. Mm -hmm. But with the help of uh, IREX, uh, and you were in on the ground floor on that one, uh, we had uh, eight Soviet colleagues of the uh, Academy um, uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences uh, at Rutgers University where they met with eight counterparts. Mm -hmm. And while we knew who was a commissar among those eight, uh, the others were quite open and quite frank and uh, mm -hmm. talked with us collegiately about problems of urban crime, I think was our first issue at the time. That was followed by visits uh, to uh, uh, the Soviet Union. The ice was broken. We could collaborate as, as scientists, uh, we became friends, and, and this is a surprising thing, every one of those who was in our counterpart team in the then Soviet Union has now emerged in the new Russia mm -hmm. or in the new Georgia mm -hmm. as leaders of the new governments, the democratic governments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we have done good work in this regard. Mm -hmm. You came to Rutgers as a distinguished professor in 1974, which, if I count right, means you've been there for 23 years or thereabouts. Uh, and yet I know that we're at a, at a stage, both in your career at Rutgers and perhaps your career in general, 
where people would be looking to kind of rest on their laurels and uh, looking to, uh, uh, you know, play golf or whatever people do when they when they get to these ages. I, I notice just by looking at our bulletin board, you're proposing to offer some brand new courses uh, that you've not taught before. Right. Uh, why? I mean, what what, what is it? What 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 possess you to to? I mean, t tell us about these new courses and, and why are you now interested in these areas? Jim, I enjoy uh, doing what I'm doing. I enjoy it thoroughly. And normally when people retire at age 65 or whenever, uh, they do for the first time what gives them joy and they call that a hobby. Mm -hmm. Well, if you will, I've been paid for my hobby all my life and there is no reason to leave my hobby and do something else. Mm -hmm. I continue doing what I'm doing because I think it gives me great pleasure and it's useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these these courses, one or two of them, if I recall, they have very intriguing titles. All right. Uh, the 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 one new course is called Origins of Criminal Justice Systems. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a question that all human beings should ask themselves uh, constantly: How do things start? How did the world start? Mm -hmm. Big Bang or whatever? Mm -hmm. How did humankind start? Mm -hmm. How did government start? How did villages start? How did criminal justice systems start? Mm -hmm. Nobody had done any research on that, and uh, but it's, it's a fascinating subject. It gets you deeply into uh, uh, archaeology, paleontology, anthropology. Uh, we will have to work with uh, colleagues, particularly in anthropology, and people who have done field work uh, all over the world among contemporary Stone Age societies, but also uh, uh, through paleontologists, uh, we have to go into uh, uh, the record of uh, ancient Neolithic or uh, Paleolithic uh, societies. It's a, a voyage of discovery which is going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't think it will yield any direct results for crime control in Newark or uh, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, but it is an intellectual exercise which I think will deepen and broaden the understanding of our students about crime and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a voyage of discovery, uh, wonderful perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so you see criminal justice as being drawing upon these other disciplines, say more traditional disciplines like anthropology and, and other areas. Absolutely. Um, we are a composite discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say you're optimistic about where we are and where we're going. Um, how about where you are and where you're going? What does what the future hold for, for Gerhard Mueller? Uh, both immediate, perhaps, and long term? I mean, you're... Uh, New projects besides, Rutgers, besides these immediate courses and so on? Rutgers University <laughs> happens to be one of the uh, uh, best institutions in higher education in the field of uh, criminal justice and criminology. So I'm very happy there. I propose to uh, uh, stay there, uh, do my work there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, from time to time I'll develop a new course. I continue writing my articles, uh, doing my research. And from time to time, uh, I will respond to uh, calls from the United Nations for assistance. Most recently, I have helped the Secretary General of the United Nations in restructuring uh, the crime prevention and criminal justice programs at the United Nations, uh, located in, in Vienna. And the Secretary General and the General Assembly have accepted my proposals. So now we have a new uh, United Nations uh, Center for International Crime Control. Uh, international crime prevention located in uh, Vienna, Austria, with strengthened uh, resources and broader mandates to deal with the crime problem worldwide. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed very much doing that. Uh, uh, just now I've been asked to uh, provide an impact evaluation of uh, past United Nations efforts in international crime prevention. So I will do that, uh, but for the most part, uh, such work is uh, pro bono, and I do it because I am enjoying it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you're also involved with an organization called ISPAC. Yes. Uh, maybe you'd say a word about that? All right. ISPAC stands for the International Scientific and Professional Advisory Council of United Nations Programs in Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. It is a roof organization of some 100 non-governmental organizations globally, organizations that are in consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, and that are interested in crime prevention and criminal justice. 
what we're doing is we're pooling the talents and resources of all those organizations and focus on one or two topics each year that are of interest to the United Nations that are within the mandates of the Secretary General in Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Last year, the topic was migration and crime. We drew on the expertise that rests within all of these organizations to come up with proposed uh, solutions. Uh, that, too, is something which I think is tremendously important. It hadn't been done before. Uh, there was no such roof organization, especially now with uh, electronic accessing. Uh, we can really work together very well and very fast, solving some of the problems that had not been solved before. Let, let me, let me uh, I guess, close our most interesting uh, conversation by harking back to something you just said and then relating that back to where we started. Um, I asked you at the beginning, how does one go about compiling such an impressive uh, curriculum vita and, 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 and this tremendous uh, record of accomplishment? And you said that you're interested in a voyage of discovery. Uh, and it seems to me that that's, that's the answer that this voyage, the seeking of this voyage, and the, and the inspiration of the voyage of discovery is what drives uh, and ultimately produces a resume that is as, as full as, uh, as this is. So if I could offer an editorial uh, comment, uh, I would certainly argue that that is part of the, uh, the explanation. You're probably right. And I thank you very much for, uh, for a most interesting uh, conversation. It's been a pleasure, and I hope that the students of the class of the year 2097 will enjoy meeting us. I hope also. Thank you. International Crime Prevention, so I will do that. Uh, but for the most part, uh, such work is uh, pro bono, and I do it because I am enjoying it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you're also involved with an organization called ISPAC. Yes. Uh, maybe you'd say a word about that? All right. ISPEC stands for the International Scientific and Professional Advisory Council of United Nations Programs in Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. It is a roof organization of some 100 non-governmental organizations globally, organizations that are in consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, and that are interested in crime prevention and criminal justice. What we're doing is we're pooling the talents and resources of all those organizations and focus on one or two topics each year that are of interest to the United Nations that are within the mandates of the Secretary General in Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Last year, the topic was migration and crime. We drew on the expertise that rests within all of these organizations to come up with proposed uh, solutions. Uh, that, too, is something which I think is tremendously important. It hadn't been done before. Uh, there was no such roof organization, especially now with uh, electronic accessing. Uh, we can really work together very well and very fast, solving some of the problems that had not been solved before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let me, let me uh, I guess, close our most interesting uh, conversation by harking back to something you just said and then relating that back to where we started. Um, I asked you at the beginning, how does one go about compiling such an impressive uh, curriculum vita and, 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 and this tremendous uh, record of accomplishment? And you said that you're interested in a voyage of discovery. Uh, and it seems to me that that's, that's the answer, that this voyage, the seeking of this voyage and the, and the inspiration of the voyage of discovery is what drives uh, and ultimately produces a resume that is as, as full as, uh, as this is. So if I could offer an editorial uh, comment, uh, I would certainly argue that that is part of the, uh, the explanation. You're probably right. And I thank you very much for, uh, for a most interesting uh, conversation. It's been a pleasure, and I hope that the students of the class of the year 2097 will enjoy meeting us. I hope also. Thank you.